Uh, in this session, let's take a quick ride on the common lid problems that we encounter in our general OPD. Uh, so I welcome our expert panelists, uh, Dr. Anish Ridhar, Dr. Shruti Tara, Dr. Ann J.K., Dr. Shebin, and also co-instructor Dr. Anju Chandran and myself, Dr. Indu Binarayanan. So let's, uh, let's begin uh, without wasting much of our time for the fruitful discussion. So first of all, let me, uh, uh, let me invite Dr. Anish Ridha. So ma'am, uh, Dr. Anish Ridha, she has done her MS from Trishu Medical College. M uh, MS from Calicut Medical College. She joined in LF 1996 and worked in various capacities and she's uh, mentored in oculoplasty under Dr. Santosh Hanavar in LVPI uh, in the year of 20, 2002. And all of us know that she has started a full-fledged prosthetic clinic in 2005. And now she's uh, currently heading the oculoplasty and neuroftal department in Little Fly Hospital. And I'm uh, very honored to say that she is my uh, mentor. So ma'am, we'll start with you. She'll be discussing on uh, Entropion, both lower lid and upper lid. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Indu, for uh, including me in this uh, session. So, uh, first we'll go on to lower, lid, lower lids. So, lower lid entropion can be involutional. Are there any PGs in this uh, session? Okay. So, uh, lower lid entropion can be involutional or cicatricial. So, you have to differentiate between the two before you start any. Uh, surgery. So, involution usually occurs in older people. Cicatricial is after a scar. So, uh, involutional entropion. This is a uh, theory question, short note. So, it, the pathophysiology of involutional entropion. So, it could be due to vertical laxity of the lower lid retractors, overriding of the preceptal over the pretarsal or orbicularis. You can see in the picture that the man has a band like uh, orbicularis there below. This is because of the overriding of the preceptal over the pretarsal orbicularis. There will be interning of the tarsal plate and also they may or may not be horizontal lid laxity. So, how do you differentiate between the two? The in involutional entropion simply if it will return to normal, the lid returns to normal after reversion. Whereas in cicatricial it will no, return to the inverted position after reversion because it is due to the scar. So you should also look for uh, lateral and horizontal laxity and look for the lateral excursion of the punctum and a snapback test to look for the vertical laxity. Dr. Ann will go into detail there. So, uh, what are the factors? All the factors that you listed before has to be corrected by when you are doing surgery. So, uh, vertical retractor laxity is corrected by plication of the lower lid retractors. Uh, overriding of the orbicularis is prevented. The pretarsal pre orbicularis riding over the pre septal orbicularis, overriding over the pretarsal orbicularis is prevented by the barrier of the suture. The inversion of the tarsus is prevented by a suture bite passing through the lower tarsus. And horizontal lid laxity, how do you correct? By shortening the lower lid. That is either by a lateral tarsal sling, the, where you shorten the lid at the lateral canthus, or by a pentagon excision. Full thickness pentagon excision, you can shorten the lid and thereby tighten it. So, uh, this is a Jones plication. Uh, he always ensure that there is, uh, if there is a uh, vertical laxity, a horizontal laxity before you start surgery. And the skin and the orbicularis are uh, separated. You can uh, check if it is a vertical retractor by just pulling on it, the lid will come down. I am sitting in the head end of the patient and uh, uh, you can see that uh, the lower lid is at the upper part of the diagram. Now, uh, the vertical retractors are plicated after passing the initial bite through the orbicularis. The suture uses 6-0 vicryl. The first suture is uh, placed and then the medial one. And you may have to fish out the vertical retractors from the depths of the incision for plication. You can take out the needle and pass it again. And the last bite is passed through the lower edge of the tarsal plate. You get a gritty feel as you pass the needle through the tarsal plate. And at the end of surgery, the lid should be a little everted. 
but if it is uh, uh, very much everted it means that there is a uh, lateral uh, horizontal laxity so you have to correct it here i'm doing a lateral tarsal sling this will be done dealt with later so this is a post op appearance so when there is acute spastic entropy on as after surgery or the severe dry eye or something you can put a plaster this helps temporarily but you may have to do a um, lower lid everting sutures here uh, from the phonix inside from the phonix through the conjunctiva the sutures are first passed double armed sutures then taken out near the uh, lid margin near the lash line superiorly and as you tighten these sutures the lid will evert so uh, you need not take out these sutures but uh, these are also a temporary measure so coming to cicatrical entropy of the lower lid if there is uh, mild uh, lid retraction and there is no lag of thalmosity is a mild cicatrization so you can just do lower lid retractor incision that is lower lid retractor recession just incise the lower lid uh, full thickness till you see the conjunctiva if there is severe lid retraction you have to incise that and also put a mucous membrane graft so here i am doing a full thickness uh, lower lid through the conjunctiva incising with the cautery and then till you see the orbicularis and then in that space you put in a mucous membrane graft taken from the lower lip so here i'm using a fibrin glue and that's just uh, sticking it on there you can also put one or two sutures just to be careful what is epiblepharon where a roll of skin pushes a lid in so this is a this may also uh, recover after when the child grows and uh, uh, here also holes procedure is used where wherein you this is a modification of jones procedure only wherein you excise a bit of the skin and the orbicularis and then pass a suture from the skin orbicularis taking a bite through the tarsal plate to fix the tarsus this is a post op appearance so coming to upper lid endropion where there is uh, upper lid endropion is never involutional so it's never involution is always cicatricial here there is shortening of the posterior lamella which is the tarsal tarsus conjunctiva and the upper lid retractors so uh, the treatment depends on the thickness of the tarsal plate if it's a thick tarsus Uh, this is a this is said in collins but uh, if, if there's a thick tarsus as in trachoma or recurrent calcion you can do a wedge resection or a tarsal fracture rotation and if it's a thin tarsus where is the tarsus thin as in steven johnson or alkali burns you can do an anterior lamella repositioning but all these uh, procedures have a high recurrence rate so now what we do is a tarsal fracture rotation mostly this is anterior lamella resection which was done some years earlier here the lid is separated into anterior and posterior lamella the anterior lamella contains the lashes misdirected lashes the skin orbicularis the posterior lamella as you know contains a tarsal plate conjunctiva mullers and elevator so the lid is incised at the gray line into two layers first you have to put an incision at the uh, lid crease so this uh, lid margin gray line incision is then connected to the lid crease incision it's a little tricky because the skin uh, can cut through as you can see here at one point and uh, you have to be very careful your resistant also has to be careful split the lid into two and then reposit the anterior lamella higher up you should it should be at least 3 or 4 mm higher up because it can come down again and pass partial thickness vicral sutures this these sutures can be locked and you need not take it out again you, this can uh, be kept there to produce a scar these sutures are locked go from one edge of the lid to the other you should go uh, nearly full length of the lid all these procedures recur that is a problem so this can be combined with a uh, upper lid uh, retractor uh, that is the conjunctiva mullers and the levator incision also to release the scar inside the skin is then sutured so this is a uh, appearance you need not cover the tarsal plate with mucous membrane amniotic membrane thing it will heal within one week this is even before the removal of the sutures you can see you need not go to that much trouble 
So tarsal wedge resection, this also we do not do nowadays. Here the tarsal plate is uh, excised as a triangle, the base facing anteriorly. And uh, you can do it with the cautery if you have a fine RF cautery. And uh, when the triangle, the base of the triangle edges are sutured, it is said that the uh, tarsal plate everts. But this too recurs and you should combine it in the diagram you can see that there is, you have, they have cut the levator there. See, this is a levator recession which is, if you don't do this it will recur very fast. Even if you do this it will recur. So, so now we do a tarsal fracture rotation. Here we cut, oh time is over. Here we uh, uh, fully incise the tarsus, 4 mm from the lid margin till you see the orbicularis from one edge to the other. Sorry. And then put everting sutures. So you have to go full length of the lid. And the needle is, double arm sutures are first used and then uh, extra needle is then we do the extra needle. So this, these are again taken out near the lash line as you drew in lower lid. And as you tighten it, it uh, everts. A little huge needle. Okay, as you tighten it, it will evert. This is this lasts a little more than the other ridges. And for localized uh, ectropion, you can do a pentagon excision. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, madam, for that beautiful talk. Uh, we shall have the discussion at the end of the session. So I request the audience to please note down your doubts so that we can have a good discussion later. Uh, I would like to invite the next speaker, Dr. Shruti Tara, who is a consultant oculoplastic surgeon at Shankara Eye Hospital, Coimbatore. She did her comprehensive fellowship at Shank uh, Shankara Eye Hospital and did her oculoplasty training at uh, Singapore NUHS and LB Prasad. She will talk to you on management of lag of thalamus. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Indu, for having included me in your uh, course. Thanks, Anju, for that uh, intro. Uh, in the next couple of minutes, we'll just go through lagophthalmus and its management. So as we all know, it's the un incomplete or the defective closure of the eyelid. So I'll not go into too much of the uh, causes of the lagophthalmus, but I will directly go into the management aspect. So these pa uh, patients present with redness, irritation, foreign body sensation, exposure keratopathy, sometimes corneal ulcer of this kind and also vision loss. So basically when we uh, divide the management, we go into the surgical, non-surgical and the medical management. Non-surgical aspect, we all are uh, very aware of what we have to do like the taping of the lids, the lubricants and the moist chambers. Medical management, again, Bell's palsy, whether it, you have to give antivirals or steroid is a, is a debate by itself. So I'll just briefly touch upon the chemical tarsorophy. Now, uh, tarsorophy, we all know. I don't think I'll go into the details because most of it, we all are doing it on our routine practice in the interest of time. I'll skip these two videos. But it is the uh, temporary tarsorophy. We are not creating any raw surface. We are just suturing the gray line to gray line. Whereas in permanent tarsorophy, we are creating a raw surface at the gray line between the posterior lid margin and the uh, cilia, the eyelashes. And uh, so we'll, I'll just skip this video. Okay. So now with chemical tarsorophy, we are uh, using the botulinum toxin type A. So what we do here is we um, mix the botulinum toxin. It comes in a 50 unit vial. Uh, so we um, uh, dilute it with 2 cc of normal saline. That gives uh, 2.5 units in 0.1 cc. And that is injected into the uh, levator. Okay. So what we do is like um, double evert with the DMARS retractor and inject it into the levator transconjunctivally. So you get the conjunctiva, you have the Mullers and behind that is the levator. So go a little deep behind the Mullers muscle and you can inject it in two to three points of 2.5 units in 0.1 cc and this is the kind of uh, droop that you can expect. 
So tarsorophy is not a bad procedure per se, but when indicated, it is really good, but it is good to know the alternatives. And not, not all lagophthalmus needs tarsorophy, and tarsorophy is usually synonymous, they say lateral tarsorophy. No, tarsorophy can be positioned wherever you want appropriately as per your needs. Now like this patient, she has had her tarsorophy done, it's a single procedure done, which is really insufficient. You can see they have done a lateral tarsal, I mean tarsorophy, lateral tarsorophy, and you can see the amount of lagophthalmus she still has, she's got no bells. So a single procedure may be insufficient in certain patients. So what do we do for these kind of patients? And we can uh, do a lateral tarsal strip. This is a very basic procedure that most of the oculoplasty surgeons do. Here if you can see that there is a droop and all that. So I have done a brow lift, but I'm not going to go into that. So lateral tarsal strip is we inject. After injecting, you do a canthotomy cantholysis. And after that, you that's a canthotomy cantholysis. And you fashion a tarsal strip. That is what you do is you, you divide the anterior and the posterior lamella and create a strip of the tarsus. And the excess tarsus is excised. And this is with a double-armed suture you anchor it to the periosteum. Now, where you anchor to the periosteum is very important. You have to anchor it at the uh, lateral tubercle. That is, you go two millimeters behind the rim and, and then you have to um, fix the tarsus. So if you see here, you can see how it goes in. I'm taking a bite at the rim. See, it's going into the orbital rim. So that inward traction is very important. Otherwise, there would be a lateral standoff and there will be tear collection at that point. So once you uh, tighten that, excess uh, skin is removed. And it's also important to form the lateral canthal sutures. So that gives an acute angle at the lateral canthus. So that again is important. So what is the other procedure is a medial canthoplasty. So what we do here is we make an incision at the junction between the skin and the uh, conjunctiva, undermine it and the orbicularis of the lower lid is hitched to the orbicularis of the upper lid. So the only drawback to that is this contour is lost here, but you can see that the patient's irritation and that foreign body and the, uh, and the congestion has completely come down. So lid load, I'm not a big fan of this. Um, yeah, but lid load can be done. Uh, where you place it is again important. I usually put it when I do, I put it at the junction of the uh, tarsal plate and the levator. Um, but it acts against, it doesn't act, uh, you know, it's always against the gravity. So when the patient uh, sits up, it doesn't, it works well, but when he lies down, it doesn't. So exposure, infection, all that are pretty common there. So mullerectomy. Now you can see this patient, the, uh, the amount of lagophthalmus that he has. Mullerectomy is something that I, I like doing. And this is one of my favorite procedures. So what I do is like again, um, uh, rit, uh, avert the lid with the DMARS, make an incision at the superior uh, uh, border of the tarsus and the conjunctiva is undermined and it is incised and reflected towards the fornix. So once the conjunctiva is reflected to the fornix and below that is the Muller's muscle. So this Muller's muscle is again separated from the uh, levator. So behind the Muller's is the levator. So you excise the entire Muller's muscle. So that's the um, Muller's. So that's the conjunctiva and then you can see that's the Muller's muscle. So you can separate the Muller's muscle. That is also reflected off uh, the tarsus and the underlying uh, levator and excised in toto. So that is removed and it is replaced with the glue. So this is the kind of uh, um, droop that you will get. We overcorrect it on the table, but uh, after a couple of weeks, it goes up. I mean about a millimeter up. So what I intend to say is you overcorrect it. So now we have um, in that Mullerectomy that, you know, I excise the entire Muller's. There's a small modification to that, which um, retains the contour of the lid. That is the central contour is maintained. Here what we do is, once the uh, levator is, um, you see that's the Muller's, this is the conjunctiva. 
you make a pillar of muller's muscle and you retain the central pillar so the central pillar of muller's is left behind we remove on either side just leaving behind the central pillar so the two strips on either side is removed only the central is left behind so that adds to the contour it gives that you know that nice curve um to the pay, uh, to the lid to the upper eyelid so again this is um closed with the glue now thermoplasty is something that it is already it has been um, explained and uh, uh, done a couple of times here what we do is we do a carunculectomy and the horner's mus the muscles which are there are like below the horizontal portion of the um um canaliculus is cauterized deep cauteri cautery is done and you hitch this so that's where the suture track will come out and i'm just marking with that the um the medial most portion of the tarsus is uh, tacked with a double armed suture and through the uh, caruncle uh, you come out so both these raw surfaces are brought together and it's hitched higher up we're just doing in uh, what i found in this is a slight recurrence but it comes down but that integration integrity is maintained you know you can see that this is how it goes under the upper eyelid and once the suture is like you know the suture track keeps it in place and the medial canthus is uh, uh, retained so no need to remove the stitch so you can just leave it there and so this patient had had his uh, uh, brow lift done elsewhere and uh, medial tarsorophy was done but still the patient had a, a residual lag of thalamus so what we did we did a lateral tarsal strip medial thermoplasty upper eyelid blepharotomy lower eyelid spacer and a limited mid face soof lift was done so this is the kind of closure that uh, he got um, he is doing well and the cornea recovered well so blepharotomy so what do we do with the blepharotomy is like a graded blepharotomy so this is fairly simple procedure through and through blepharotomy is done so the skin the orbicularis and above the tarsal plate it is done at the level of the tarsal plate so a through and through it is incised and the skin is closed so you put a protective i have put a uh, confirmer inside before incising so you can put the protective coat so it helps even in patients like this with a very bad thyroid eye disease and exposure keratopathy and spacers so you can either use sclera uh, hpmg whatever but in this i have used fillers you can see that that there is a retraction here and a patient with bell's palsy is recovered bell's palsy with a few residual uh, lesions were there and uh, so this is the amount of lift that you can get in thyroid related orbitopathy again um this both these patients had a fat and a three wall uh, bony decompression and can bring down the um a uh, lag of thalamus so ptosis when it is overcorrected can have this so here i have done the recession of the levator transposition flap in cicatricial and 5 fluoro uracil of 5 50 mg per ml in 0.2 to 0.4 ml is injected and you can see the amount of uh, correction that they can get zplasty is another excellent procedures when in severe badly uh, traumatized lids you can see the eyebrow is almost at the mid forehead level and multiple zplasty was done and you can see how much it has reduced and again skin grafts is an excellent procedure when needed so multiple skin grafts was done in this patients to reduce the lag of thalamus so basically no single procedure will work we might have to combine all of them from tarsorophy to botulinum toxin to medial lateral canthoplasty lid weights brow lifts blepharoplasty soof lift and sometimes even reanimation so it's a multiple procedure of choice and tailor made to the patients thank you thank you ma'am for that excellent presentation it was uh, the topic has been fully covered in the show very span of time uh, now i invite the next speaker dr ann j k uh, she is uh, as me the consultant in oculoplasty and neuroophthalmology services in little flower hospital langamali for more than 12 years 
Over to you, ma'am. She will be talking on ectropion. Thank you, Dr. Indu and KSOS for having me here. So my topic is ectropion. And most of my, um, few of my slides are overlapping with the previous speakers. So I will skip that. Ectropion, as all of us know, is the outward eversion of the lid margin. And like many other conditions, it is also classified as acquired and congenital. Congenital is not very rare, but acquired is more common, of which involutional or senile ectropion is the most common. Other types are psychiatrical, paralytic, mechanical. Involutional ectropion, um, before that we have to know what is the support of the lower lid. So lower lid is supported by a tarso ligamentous sling which is consisting of medial canthal tendon, lateral canthal tendon, tarsal plate and also uh, capsular pipebral fascia and orbicularis. So the laxity of this tarso ligamentous sling can give rise to horizontal lengthening of the lid. Uh, lid, uh, horizontal uh, lid lengthening and uh, generalized loss of elastin can cause uh, thinning of the tarsal plate along with orbicularis atrophy can contribute to uh, involutional ectropion. So evaluation, uh, horizontal laxity, um, to measure horizontal laxity you just have to pull the uh, lid away from the globe and the displacement if it is more than 2 millimeter that means there is horizontal laxity. For medial canthal tendon laxity, uh, pull the lid laterally and note the displacement of the punctum. If it is more than 2 millimeter, I mean up to 2 millimeter is normal. If it is more than 2, two millimeter, it is mild and moderate if it is up to the limbus and if it is severe, it will reach up to the pupil. And look for the signs of facial nerve palsy also like lag of thalmos, uh, absent wrinkles over the forehead deviation of angle of mouth. Also make a note of condition of the puncture. That is whether it is stenosed, everted, and also keratinization of lead margins is there. Any misdirect la misdirected lashes and the condition of ocular surface. And about the lateral candle tendon laxity, uh, lateral candle angle uh, has an acute configuration. So when it is rounded like this, that means there is disinsertion or laxity of the lateral candle tendon. And if you pull the lateral candle tendon medially, more than 2 millimeter, uh, that means there is laxity. So there is a grading system. Normally, uh, in normal lower lid, you should not see the punctum unless you pull it down. And in grade 1, you can see only the punctum is everted, grade 1 ectropion. If the palpebral conjunctiva is seen, it is grade 2. And if the phonix is also visible, that is grade 3. So coming to the management of generalized ectropion, if there is horizontal lid shortening, you can do a pentagon excision. And it, you know, size of the pentagon when, will depend upon the uh, amount of laxity and you can suture it just like you do a litter suturing. So the uh, where you put the pentagon is like uh, where is the most dependent part of the uh, ectropion. And the details of suturing Dr. Indu will be dealing with. Medial ectropion um, here uh, if it is uh, only medial ectropion you can excise a tarso conjunctival diamond from the uh, conjunctiva, I mean that is the from inferior part of the punctum and put it in such a way, everting sutures are put so that it is inverted. If it is associated with horizontal uh, lid laxity also, you have to combine with uh, pentagon excision. So uh, most of the times uh, these procedures are not done in isolation, you have to uh, combine it with other procedures also. This is a procedure done in minimal punctal ectropion. That is, you can cauterize the conjunctiva and uh, tarsal plate beneath the punctum, no, uh, taking care not to injure the canaliculus. So this will give inversion of the punctum. Then comes lateral tarsal strip. So my previous speakers has already described it in detail. So what we do is, uh, this is to tighten the lateral candle tendon and also to correct the horizontal lid laxity. So a lateral canthotomy is done, uh, cantho inferior cantholysis is done and uh, a tarsal strip is fashioned and it is 
attached to the um, periorbital uh, lateral orbital rim and this is the video i am not showing it since dr shruti has given a detailed description and the points to be noted is like it has to be at a higher level and it is should be at the from the inner aspect of the uh, lid and then only the tears will flow to the punctum and it will not stand out like and the tension you have to assess by uh, i mean it should be in under adequate tension otherwise it will cause entropion or ectropion so this procedure can be done both in entropion and ectropion then comes cicatrical ectropion so cicatrical ectropion is seen in upper lid also in some congenital conditions like ectosis so i am talking about uh, traumatic um, acquired uh, ectropion mostly traumatic this is due to shortening of the anterior lamella that is skin and orbicularis it can be either uh, localized or generalized in localized ectropion uh, this lady has got a trauma and after healing this led to a contracture of the skin and anterior lamella here and uh, this is a generalized ectropion caused by facial burns management it can be either a medical or a surgical or a combination of both so you can do scar massage uh, in the immediate post op period i mean that is after the wound has healed when the skin has healed after 2 weeks suture removal the scar uh, massage will help by uh, disruption of the uh, fibrinocytes and also collagen disruption so what you do is if it is a vertical scar you have to massage in the upward direction and it can also be uh, combined with intralesional injection of immunomodulators steroids triamcinolone 40 mg per ml concentration you can do it and uh, multiple sessions you can give 2 to 3 weeks apart along with that uh, scar massage is also done or 5 fluorouracil is another um, immunomodulator so this patient had a bad lid tear and after that uh, after this is the picture after uh, one or two months so he has got a scar and contracture there and he has an ectropion here so we did a scar release and uh, multiple injections were given along with the scar massage and after three months uh, there is improvement in the uh, quality of the scar this lady i have shown previously cicatrical ectropion because she had uh, hor sufficient horizontal uh, lid laxity we did a scar release and excision of the scar with pentagon excision and after surgery the there is some dent here uh, but the um scar is much better and this we can manage with massage and medical management in relational injections surgical management it includes plasty flaps etc so this is a said plasty so here the vertical scar is turned into a uh, is it so that flaps are taken so that it the vertical thing is the flaps are reoriented in such a way that this uh, vertical segment is lengthened which uh, improved his ectropion if there is a considerable amount of uh, contraction we have to go for flaps or grafts either full thickness or partial thickness uh, grafts has to be taken so the problem is you have to find a matching skin the eyelid skin is very uh, peculiar in its thinness and it has uh, no subcutaneous fat so the most matching lid uh, skin would be upper eyelid skin other options are retroauricular skin supraclavicular skin and upper inner arm skin so this lady this girl uh, came with a history of abscess here and it ruptured and finally Uh, he she had uh, ectropion here and uh, her complaint was watering so a skin graft was put it was taken from the upper lid and uh, this is after 2 weeks and after 2 months this is the appearance uh, she uh, some pigmentation is there but the ectropion is relieved paralytic ectropion uh, patient will come with lag of thalamus and watering so dr shudhi has to uh, I had a talk extensively about it so look for the signs of facial nerve palsy and the watering is due to decreased orbicularis tone corneal exposure etc so even if you correct the ectropion patient may not be relieved of uh, watering so you have to uh, warn the patient be, uh, about that 
and in um, mild cases you can do lateral candle sling and tarsography also and if required you have to do medial canthoplasty also finally mechanical ectropion uh, so this is caused by the mass near the lid margin so uh, the treatment is removal of the uh, causative agent that is the mass and you have to reconstruct the lid by appropriate methods depending upon the pathology thank you thank you dr ann for that uh, wonderful talk next i invite dr shebin Next, I invite Dr. Shebin Salim. She is a consultant in Oculopla Department of Oculoplasty, Giridhar Eye Hospital. Uh, she completed her DNB and fellowship in Shankar and Italia. And uh, she has participated in many uh, in national and international conferences. One uh, case was uh, Best Paper and Poster Award 2021. Over to you, Dr. Shebin. She will be talking on lash abnormalities and management. Thank you, Intu, for that kind introduction and thank you for uh, including me in this. So, my topic is on lash abnormalities and management. After all, uh, those colorful presentations, I hope it is not very boring. Okay. So, um, as important are these lashes to us for the cosmetic appearance? If they are malpositioned or uh, uh, located at a different place, they can be extremely uh, bothersome and can even lead to blindness. So before going to the lash abnormalities, uh, let us see the anatomy first. The lashes are located in the uh, lid margin that is on the anterior lash line. Of, uh, it's around five to six rows in the upper lid and three to four rows in the lower lid. And we have to know the uh, depth of the lash root that is important when it comes to the management that is uh, 2.4 millimeter in the upper lid and 1.4 millimeter in the lower lid. And the, mainly the lashes, they protect us from uh, other uh, uh, external stimulus, noxious agent, and also they initiate a protective mechanism and uh, causing the bling reflex. So what are the common lash abnormalities? It could be, uh, it can be divided into problems with direction and position, pigmentation or growth. Uh, these are the uh, major, pro major problems. So, uh, in, uh, when it comes to the direction, we have trichiasis. So, what is trichiasis? Trichiasis is characterized by the misdirection of hair. hair. So, it could be primary or secondary. In primary trichiasis, there is, there is misdirection of the hair shaft. In uh, secondary trichiasis, the ori there is normal orientation of the hair shaft, but because of the abnormal positioning of the lid, that is in, because of the endropion, there is misdirection. Then we have dystrichiasis. It is characterized by an abnormal uh, row of lashes. Um, uh, yeah. So this is a patient with uh, dystrichiasis. We can see that abnormal row of lashes that is located uh, just behind the meibomian gland orifices. So um, uh, it can be located anywhere else also. When it comes to pigmentation, we have uh, the polyosis where there is uh, loss of pigmentation of the lashes. And uh, in terms of growth, we have hypotrichosis. It is, it is a generalized term that uh, denotes generalized reduction in the number or density of the hair anywhere in the body. When it, is com when it comes to the lid alone, we call it milphosis. Medrosis notes both lo uh, bo uh, denotes both uh, loss of lashes as well as uh, eyebrows. Then we have hypertrichosis and trichomegaly. Hypertrichosis is more uh, a generalized term. Trichomegaly is uh, the, when there is increased lash length, curl, stiffness, pigmentation, or thickness. Dystrichiasis again could be either congenital or acute. In congenital, there is a differentiation of uh, pilosebaceous seb units into lashes instead of the meibomian gland. Acute dystrichiasis usually occurs uh, in case of chronic inflammation, usually Steven, following Steven Johnson syndrome, ocular psychiatric pemphigoid, chemical injury, thermal injury, where there is metaplasia of the meibomian glands into pilosebaceous units. It could be either isolated or syndromic also. Uh, syndromic, it is associated with autosomal lymphedema dystrichiasis syndrome, mandibulofacial dystonia and uh, Setley syndrome, which is an ectodermal dysplasia. And uh, this is another condition that is lash ptosis. It, it usually coexists with the congenital and acute blepharotosis, but this can be also seen in cases of floppy eyelid syndrome, leprosy, facial nerve pulsing, and also in case of dermatocalysis with an anterior lamellar slide. So this is used, uh, caused by anatomical changes in the orbicularis oculi, rhyolens muscle, and tarsal plate. 
uh, most of the patients complain of this as a cosmetic abnormality, but then again, if the lashes are very thick, can even cause upper lid visual uh, upper visual field restriction. The treatment is anterior lamellar repositioning. Then uh, I will be mainly concentrating on trichiasis and dystrichiasis. So, what are the etiologies? It could uh, it could be blepharitis, trachoma, chemical burns, thermal burns, any trauma, a lid margin scar following trauma or surgery, ocular psychiatric pemphigoid, Steven Johnson syndrome, and post irradiation. One important etiology that we should uh, think is ocular psychiatric pemphigoid that often uh, we will uh, will miss in the clinics because. When it comes to the management, in case of ocular psychiatric pemphigoid, we have to treat the inflammation first. Otherwise, it can, uh, if we do any intervention, this again aggravate the condition. So, uh, patient presents with a uh, number of uh, symptoms, including foreign body sensation, watering, discharge, blepharospasm, conjunctival injection, pain, photophobia. Complications, we know that it leads to superficial keratopathy, abrasion, infection, uh, later vascularization, opacities, and even loss of vision. So how to evaluate? Evaluation is the most important key. We should know the history, then look for the lid margin position if there is any entropion. And when, when it comes to the abnormal lashes, how many numbers? Is it single or group if it is involving the entire lid margin and location of the root? If there is any uh, associated blepharitis, lid margin keratinization, cicatricial changes in the palpable or fornicial conjunctiva, if there is shortening of the fornices, if there is any simbliferon. So these... The uh, last mentioned points, this will definitely change your management plan. So, uh, diagnosis is not a great challenge, but it is essential to detect the associated condition that may change the treatment strategy. The goals of treatment include preservation of vision, comfort, and an acceptable appearance of the lid. So, basically, the treatment depends on the etiology, the extent of the abnormality, the location of the lashes, associated entropion, lid margin keratinization, active inflammation, and also the needs of the individual patient. So, if there is only trichiasis, we can uh, consider lash removal or ablation procedures. When the, that, that is as in this patient. When there is trichiasis and entropion, we have to correct the uh, lid position also by lid margin rotation techniques or an anterior lamellar recession. When there is associated uh, posterior lamellar issues like uh, shortening or uh, scarring or if there is lead margin keratinization, then the game plan totally changes. So then comes the mucous membrane crafting. So that, ne uh, that is needed for lengthening the posterior lamella as well as we have to resist the anterior lamella. So, this, uh, so in these cases, an MMG can be combined with an anterior lamellar recession or a terminal tarsal rotation or tarsotomy that is already described in the previous classes. So here we can see that there is scarring or shortening of the posterior uh, lamella. So again, this can be classified into removal procedures or repositioning procedures. We'll come to one by one. In manual epilation, this is simple and inexpensive. We use an epilation forceps. So uh, what we have to remember is we have to uh, hold the near the root. Otherwise, the lashes will easily break, uh, cause, uh, leaving a sharp step. That will even cause more irritation. Then again, recurrence is the rule in four to six weeks. So comes the electrolysis. Uh, all this is done under local anesthesia. In electrolysis, the tip of the electrode is inserted into the follicle opening. Uh, if it is in the upper lid, around 2.4 millimeter depth. If it is in the lower lid, around 1.4 millimeter depth. Very small electrical current of uh, 2.5 to 3 milliampere is applied until the bubbling is noted at the follicular orifice. Again, there is high chance of recurrence in electrolysis and it causes a lot of collateral thermal injury to the surrounding structure. So usually this is not preferred nowadays. So uh, radio frequency ablation is one of the preferred technique now if it is for a few lashes. Uh, it is done with a fine needle. It, the needle is inserted alongside of the lash. Radio frequency pulse is applied for 5 to 10 seconds. So uh, ideally when we remove the uh, needle, the lash along with the root should come with the uh, needle. But uh, if it, it, it hasn't come, we can uh, remove it uh, with the forceps and then it should be coming very freely without any attachment. So uh, this is more effective, success rate is more than 60 percentage and there is less complication. So in order to improve the success rate, you can even try injecting mitomycin C around the, uh, along with the um, along with radio frequency ablation, 0 0.02 percentage. So this study noted that there is an increased uh, success rate following mitomycin injection. 
then argon laser so argon laser the here the lashes are individually treated with argon laser the P laser is ab absorbed by the melanin so um, uh, there can they, they can also cause uh, depigmentation sometimes here it converts energy to heat and burns nearby tissues the laser setting is uh, 1.5 watts uh, again this needs a lot of expertise so cryotherapy uh, can be uh, used for a group of lashes in case of congenital distichiasis the uh, lash the uh, lid can be split and it can be applied along to the distichiatic lashes so this is another technique where we, we can use thistless microtrifine to uh, take out individual lash roots so and, and if it is a focalized tri uh, uh, focalized trichiasis we can even use a pentagonal wedge resection especially in patients following trauma and uh, scars so uh, this I'm not uh, going into detail already described so this is uh, uh, this technique is used when there is excessive scarring especially in case of SJS uh, cicatricial pemphigoid and all so what we have to do here is we have to entirely remove the scarred conjunctiva and also recess the anterior lamella then put the mucous membrane graft here uh, okay so epiblepharon already described so this is uh, so this is uh, 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 this is a case of eyebrow uh, strip composite eyebrow graft this is for uh, especially in cases of uh, uh, surgical reconstruction where the where we leave the patient without any lashes so here uh, care should be taken to uh, exactly um, adjust the orientation of the l l lash direction so here we can see the patient with uh, elongated lashes of course we have to trim it then uh, one uh, last important point when we are giving all these prostaglandin analogs that are uh, uh, available over the counter nowadays we care should uh, we have to think of prostaglandin associated periorbitopathy so these products are there available for uh, uh, hypotrichosis and uh, to increase the pigmentation thickening of the lashes so this is one side effect that we have to think so to ta uh, take home messages appropriate treatment is selected for the specific problem at hand thank you Thank you, Shebin, for teaching us how to tackle tricky trichiasis. Next, it gives me pleasure to invite the last speaker, uh, our chief instructor, Dr. Indu, for her talk. Uh, Indu did her post-graduation in ophthalmology at Government Medical College, Kodikod, after which she went on to do her fellowship in oculoplasty at Little Flower Eye Hospital, Angamali. Currently, she is consultant in orbit and oculoplasty at Comtrust Eye Hospital. She will be talking today on how to tackle lid tears perfectly. Thank you, Dr. Anju, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so, towards the last session of our top, uh, IC, uh, we'll be dealing with the lid tears. So, how do we tackle in its perfection? So, how to repair a lid tear? What are the aims of a repair or a lit air repair? What we need to do is uh, we need to restore the functional aspects. So once after the repair, there should be uh, nil uh, watering for the patient, nil ptosis for the patient, nil lag of thalmos, and of course the best possible cosmetic outcome. So how do we achieve this? So the answer is always, I feel, it's a meticulous primary lit repair. So when a case of lit air comes, what all things do we need to analyze? So these are the points that we should be thinking, uh, we should be taking into account when a lit air comes. Whether it's a partial thickness or a full thickness lit air, whether it's a margin involving or not. If it's a margin involving, you need to be a bit more careful and expertise is required. And always remember, when it's a case of litter which is medial to the puncta, always do not, never forget to do a probing and explore if there is a canalicular involvement. And also explore if there is any levator involvement if the injury is like above the tarsal plate. Another point that we need to assess is the tissue loss. So, uh, oftenly, the, there may not be much of tissue in, loss in many of the cases. Uh, it is always a pseudo-appearance which gives a tissue loss like appearance. 
okay so uh, it could be due to the recoil of the tissues or it could be due to the edema or maybe perhaps it could be due to it's always like solving a jigsaw puzzle so if it is not properly aligned also they can it can result in a lacuna so when you have placed this almost well there might not be any real tissue loss so coming to our uh, main topic of interest which is a lid margin repair the basic principle of a margin repair is that uh, these are the two very important points the sutures need to be equidistant as well as of equal depth so this is how it goes basically we are placing a vertical mattress suture and this is how it goes so it is also called as 3311 rule or otherwise called as far far near near rule so we enter through the uh, we enter at a point of 3 3 meibomian gland orifice and then horizontally take it at equal depth come out at point of 3 and then again at a point of 1 you enter again horizontally uh, move and then come out at the point of 1 So here, this is a video showing a full thickness letter which is involving the margin in the upper lid. Anesthesia is given, and here what I am doing is because uh, the tarsus is not much ex exposed, I am uh, cutting a bit of the orbicularis, and I am taking the partial tarsal sutures at first. It is almost ideal to uh, do the lid margin suture at first rather than the tarsus. so here it has always remember it has always to be a partial thickness one otherwise it will rub on the cornea now on the margin you can see that i'm taking the suture i'm showing the gray line at first and sutures are to be placed at the gray line so here at the point of 3 always ask your assistant so that you have to retract the upper lid so that uh, you have a very good visualization and the suture which is used for the tarsal plate it's 60 vicryl and for the skin uh, lid margin it is always 60 mer silk so once uh, you are suturing it and tightening it always see that you are doing in a horizontal way as you see in the video horizontal way so that you minimize the rub on the cornea again as the assistant you should have a very good assistant to do that to retract the lid and the point of how much to tighten is a very important thing so what you need to do is not just a very superficial approximation is not just the end point what you need to do is just a heap up position is required of the margins only then in the post operative period it will flatten So now the suture as simple sutures are taken on the posterior lamella and similarly a simple suture is also taken on the lash line and finally in the lash line suture you can in order to reduce the uh, rubbing the of the suture on the cornea you can even bury the sutures the uh, lower two sutures onto that now finally closure of the orbicularis as well as the skin sutures so this is how the patient looked in the post op period he is doing fine now if it is not well dealt it can result in complications here you can see the lid margin notching and also this is a very bad cicatrix which is causing the cicatricial ectropion and even it can result in lag of thalamus so now moving to the next one that is a canalicular tear repair the most common cases that would come to our casualties and with this uh, canalicular tear it is often uh, in case of infants it's the blouse hook injuries or but i we see more cases among the siblings which is uh, due to cradle hook and this is the most uh, uh, this is the real culprit so here is a video of the canalicular repair 
here you can see the floor of the canaliculus this is the proximal cut end of the canaliculus so the first and foremost thing that you need to do is a well dilatation dilatation of the puncta so that this will help so you are basically threading the canaliculus so once if it is not fully dilated what happens is that you will end up in uh, difficulties with insertion of the mini monoca or the unicanaliculus tent now here now here you can see that this is the distal end which is seen which is identified as the pearly white structure once it is seen you need to confirm it by passing a probe and uh, you will get a hard stop so now you are uh, threading the canaliculus with the unicanaliculus tent or the mini monoca always use a non tooth instrument for the insertion now pull it out until you have that it is fully inserted now passing it through the distal end once it is the proper canalic distal part of the canaliculus it will go in fine very smoothly now we are suturing the pericanal pericanalicular tissue and suturing of the skin so the next step but the most important step is to suture the conjunctiva this can be either done as a first step also but always see that it is being done otherwise the tissue may not hold and can even go in for necrosis so this was the post operative picture of the patient you can see the canaliculus uh, threaded with the mini monoca and patient has nil watering these are some of the cases of upper lid and the lower lid canalicular tear and beware if the canaliculus is not uh, the if the distal end of the canaliculus it's not properly identified and if it is not into the distal end this can happen the can uh, this the mini monoca it has the distal end has come out through the skin here so finally what we have to do is just take it out remove the stent off and uh, this is the last slide there are some uh, certain conditions where you need not even suture like in a very superficial wound uh, where and especially if it's a kid not able to or we need to take in for a gi you can avoid it by using a sturdy strips which are placed uh, vertically 90 degree to the sutures i mean uh, the so with that i finally uh, i would like to acknowledge my alma mater little flower hospital many of uh, some of the photos i have taken when i was doing my fellowship and dr anju chandran for the video thank you thank you indu for that lucid presentation i believe this is one of the most basic skills uh, not just an oculoplastic surgeon but a basic uh, but an ophthalmologist should possess So with that we come to the end of the talks uh, if the audience would like to ask any questions to the speakers uh so we had uh, we had meant madam you had mentioned uh, lid diverting sutures that are done prior to a cataract surgery how much gap would you give between posting the patient for a cataract surgery and the lid diverting sutures yes for entropion there need not be any gap we should they be need not do it on the table same day two or three days after give an antibiotic ointment or something and these are temporary also you have to see after cataract if you take uh, with recurs again you have to do a permanent procedure i would like to ask uh, dr shruti uh, what is your experience with the upper lid entropion and uh, like the recurrence and uh, what is the surgery of choice Uh, upper lid entropion is definitely a, a challenge um usually i do a terminal tarsal rotation um and that has worked well in my hands it depends whether if it is cicatricial then yes i would go in for grafts uh, but otherwise terminal tarsal rotation is what i do normally 
In fact, for me, I've had issues with the lower lid entropian. That's what I was asking her. What do you do for lower lid entropians, which like keeps recurring? Now it totally changed. Uh, Where's the resection with the contractor reinsertion? It will. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you have told that uh, the graft, what is the, which is the most common site that you prefer for a graft? For the upper lid, uh, I prefer to take the retro auricular if I need a good press graft. It matches very well. Uh, or you can take it also from the upper eyelid. Um, if the eyelids are normal, you can take from the contralateral side if there is sufficient laxity. So for that, what, uh, what I usually do is the measure, that is your anterior lamella, what you leave behind should be at least 20 millimeters, like how we do for the blepharoplasty. Uh, otherwise, uh, retroauricular area suits best. If it's extensive, as uh, Dr. Ann was telling, you can take from the supraclavicular area, but uh, the color uh, mismatches there. That one that I showed you there with the multiple skin grafts that I did uh, was a burns injury. So she had, uh, they had got it uh, done uh, in Dubai, I think, with all grafts done from the retro, uh, supraclavicular, they are taken from the arms and everywhere. But then, uh, fortunately, retroauricular space was left behind, so I took it up. I would like to ask one question to Dr. Shruti about the thermoplasty. So you are uh, cauterizing, I mean, ablating the carinkle. So can you elaborate on that? This is something that we have started doing recently. I don't have a long-term follow-up, but it has held for up to three months. Um, we are still looking to see uh, how long it would sustain. If it is six months, then we would probably publish that. Uh, what we are doing is initially we are uh, making a carunculectomy. You are taking a carunculectomy first and a triangular uh, uh, base up. That is your base of the triangle should be just below the um, horizontal portion of the canaliculus and the apex towards the fornix. So that area is deeply th cauterized with the, you can either use a bipolar or you can use a fulguration tip. And then the medial to that, that a lateral to that is the medial most portion of the, uh, the tarsal plate. You're taking a um, two uh, double armed suture and including the thermal uh, area and the carunculer area and you're going a little posterior. So that is the contour that we want. We want the lid to go and follow the globe like how we do the laterally also. So it should go under the upper eyelid and follow the contour of the globe. And that higher end is not to keep that lid as high as that. It is just you anchor it as high as possible because using we are using vicryl only. So we are expecting that the uh, the fibrosis will hold it in place there. But we are not removing the sutures. We are just leaving it like that. It does come down by a millimeter or two. It will come down. But so far it is holding. Um, the lids are inverted. I mean the punctum is inverted quite well and it is thing. But only thing is you won't be seeing the caruncle. It is on to the periosteum or uh, to if the... If you can actually get to the periosteum it's very, it's very good. But yeah. otherwise it's very difficult. I yeah. used to do initially open technique. I used to do just like DCR how we do. Open up and then take the lid and anchor it uh, as far posterior as possible. But again anchoring it to the periosteum even if it is open is a little difficult because the bone is so thin there. It's difficult to fix it. Yes, there will be kinking of the canal. But then again, this is mostly done for the patients with facial palsy. It doesn't really matter when it, yeah, anyway, it will be kinked. So, uh, any tips in very distal canalicular injuries where uh, it is really difficult to find the other end? Yeah, there are situations. Medial canalicular injuries. Very medial canalicular injuries, uh, it is very difficult almost always. Uh, but uh, what, what in every canalicular tear, I guess what is the main thing is that you need to retract the tissues uh, very medially so that in order to visualize the medial sector like that. And you can also use the dye inject from the upper canaliculus if it is intact and to see like fluorescent dye so that you have, you can visualize the cut end of the canaliculus.
uh anything else another thing would be to take up the patient as soon as possible so that inflammation does not set in and it's easier to dissect through the tissues without much bleeding next thing what you can do is you can also pull up with uh, saline or whatever dye is available and inject air through the upper canaliculus so that you can see the bubbles coming up through that most often if you pass the probe and uh, align it along the anatomical route you are uh, most likely to find it unless it's a very bad tear the other panelists if any to add once you infiltrate the local uh, in that area it just swells up and it's a little difficult to get another tip is like which i found always useful is when you actually retract usually it will be retrocurricular so when you push the curricular and curriculum c among the red area you can see a pale round disc so that would that's your punctum which is pouting so you should just look for that pale area there for the benefit of the postgraduates here that sign is called a calamari sign uh with that we come to the end of the session i request all the panelists to please pose for a group photo dr marian please join us too and uh, i call upon dr ani madam to hand away a token for our invited speaker dr shruti tara